Thank you uh, very much. At least uh, a successful match already during this uh, master class. Um, I suggest, because we've we got about 15 minutes left in this session, that we, we open the floor now. Um, that means uh, both here as well as the audience for, for questions either to Michael O'Leary or to the, uh, the young innovators that have presented their cases. I think there are microphones, if I'm not mistaken. Otherwise, you need to really shout. Um, there are microphones. Can, can, can we start over here, maybe in the front? Please um, introduce yourself briefly and then ask your, your question. Um, I'm Kumar Deep Chatterjee. I'm the founder and president of the European Young Innovators Forum, from where these innovators have turned up. So firstly, thank you, Michael. We prepared them for a session with you, but it was fantastic. I think you gave them a lot of advice, and Gisela might have found her first investor, so that's fantastic. Um, I have two questions for you, Michael, but before that, just briefly, I wanted to thank uh, the Commission for being innovative and actually organizing this master class, and uh, we were very honored to uh, help you organize that, and I think it was great, so great initiative to engage young people uh, by Ms. Jan Smith, Ms. De La Torre, and of course, Peter and uh, Charlotte, who worked very hard for this, so thank you. Um, now, Michael, I have two questions. One, yesterday we heard from Silvina Venturina Fendi, uh, that in her company, in Fendi, she really sort of encourages young people. So she, um, the average age of somebody in her labs is 23 years old. 23 years, which I think is fantastic, and she encourages young talent to be disruptive. So the question to you is, Ryanair has been the most disruptive, innovative business model we've seen in the airline industry in Europe, but also elsewhere. Do you, do you encourage young talent in your company? What's the sort of average age and how do you go about encouraging that? The second question is, you know, and this is probably one of your favorite topics, there is a plethora of EU regulation that in one way or the other prevents startups or, okay, it's not exactly conducive to startups expanding. And that's changing. The Commission is making a lot of effort to change that with the Horizon 2020. It's a huge effort. But what in your mind are the two top regulations that are preventing more iron airs from popping up all over Europe? Apart from the fact that Michael O'Leary is not replaceable, but... Uh... <laughs> Sadly, I am. Um, firstly, I think it's very important, uh, and I would like to, comm to commend, I think, Commissioner Gagan Quinn. I think it's no secret that uh, the, it's the Irish Commissioner, I don't want to be parochial, but the Irish Commissioner is the one pushing forward this innovation conference at the agenda. I am a bit concerned, though, that there's a bit, with the greatest respect, there's a bit too much focus on it's only the young people can be innovative. Speaking as someone who's just turned 50, uh, I'm no longer young, but I still like to think that I can be innovative. And I think what we've got to do is you've got to encourage innovation everywhere. Yes, the young people are naturally innovative because young people should be rebellious, revolutionary, change everything. But there's nothing stopping middle-aged people and older people being innovative as well. You've just got to get up off your asses and try to do something that's revolutionary. Does Ryanair encourage change? Yes, we do. The average age of the company is 25. Uh, we employ 7,000 people. Uh, and we, the great strength of Ryanair, again, is because we've never recruited anybody who worked in an airline before, we promote people from within all the time. So we take all of our, most of our senior management came from people who started off either as cabin crew or in check-in or in engineering, uh, repair, uh, fixing airplanes. And we promote people up quickly, which is the good side is that there's great opportunities for promotion within Ryanair. The bad side is some people get promoted too quickly and they fail. And I think that what you do then is they've got to leave. So you have to have in any entrepreneurial company, we are, I think, naturally rebellious. I think it's an Irish thing, too, that we're rebellious and we're revolutionary. We, but I, I think also because there's a commitment across the management of Ryanair to always look at something different uh, and to, to, to be brave, to try new things. I mean, we're the only people that still talks about where's the next innovation in the airline industry. And I keep talking about well, it's taking out some of the seats on board the aircraft. I'd like to have a sitting cabin and a standing cabin. But the standing cabin would be one euro. The sitting cabin would be 25 euros. But there'll be some bureaucrat somewhere who says, oh, oh you can't do that because it'd be, it wouldn't be safe. It'd be perfectly safe on one-hour flights. They allow you to stand on trains. They allow you to stand on the underground in London or the metro in Madrid. But some bureaucrat somewhere is going to stop you standing at the back of an airplane where, and I, I say, why don't we just test it? Because if we did a couple of trial flights across Europe where we said, the front half of the plane has seats, they're 25 euros. The back half of the plane is standing room only where you're holding on to a rail, that's one euro. I guarantee you the one euro cabin will fill first. The 25 euro cabin will fill second. But 
there's a reluctance all the time, particularly among politicians and bureaucrats. I think, you know, and give me one example. I don't share your faith that Europe is suddenly, or the Commission is suddenly, you know, adapting to more uh, innovative methods. ETS, this emissions trading scheme, which is a complete load of bloody nonsense being introduced by Europe, imposed on the airlines in the 1st of January 2012. We're going to, the Commission is now going to make it more expensive for Europe's citizens to fly around Europe on some bullshit uh, environmental thing that, oh, this is suddenly going to save the world because we're taxing people who fly. The, no other economic zone is going to tax people who fly. The Americans have just passed a law through the House of Congress preventing the American airlines paying for it. The Chinese have already told the Europeans Chinese airlines aren't paying for it. So who's going to finish up paying for it? Europe's consumers. We're about to make flying more expensive in Europe from 2012. Congratulations, the European Commission. At a time of deep recession, only the European Commission could invent something as stupid as this. And the sad thing about it is they then designed the scheme that gives the biggest amount of free emissions to the biggest polluters. So if I'm the biggest airline in Europe, I'll get the biggest amount of free emissions. If I need to grow next year, guess who I buy those emissions from? Even bigger polluters than the airlines, I buy them from the cement companies, the power generators. But it means if somebody starts up a new airline somewhere in Europe, they can't grow because they've got to buy their emissions from even bigger polluters than them. And it's this kind of stupid, well-meaning regulation that by the time it gets through Brussels, simply finishes up making flying more expensive for Europe citizens and makes the European economy less competitive. And that's the kind of stupidity that we need to blow up an end in Brussels. Okay, next question. <laughs> the gentleman over there, please introduce yourself and... And ask the question. Thank you. My name is Julian Marr. I'm a research scientist from St. George's Hospital in London. Um, I enjoyed all the talks, but I noticed that nobody has talked about intellectual property. And I'd like to ask Mr. O'Leary what he feels about the patent system as it stands, whether you think it encourages or discourages innovation. Funnily enough, I'm a supporter generally of the patent system. I do think it encourages innovation. I do think particularly the cost of the innovation in the areas like medicine and science and research. We have to fund uh, science and research. And I don't, haven't yet come across a better system of doing that than the patent system. So I actually am a supporter of that system. I do believe that the people, the really committed scientists and the researchers and the people doing that kind of cutting edge technology, Alex, for example, uh, delivering the cell membrane uh, system. I think Maria as well, which is a kind of a, I worry about her business model in, you know, the problem, because the problem for Maria in digitizing art is how do you, uh, you know, keep the company or how do you sustain a company like that, a young, valuable, innovative company from some bloody monster like Google coming along and just smashing up the business model. So I think the patent system is a very valuable system. I do think it encourages it, that investment in research and uh, R&D. And we have, if we're going to continue to be innovative, invest in research and R&D. Just to, to remind that for a generation... I think that was such a good question, uh, by the way. You, I, a... you, you deserve a copy of the free... <laughs> it, it's very important when you're researching and developing and you're stuck in some lab in London that you can look at something attractive there just to, to stimulate the, uh, the mind. Very good. I mean, just to say that the Commission for a generation has been pushing the community patent and that we might finally get it, so that would be good news. We don't want to disadvantage the anybody there. in the back, so there's one hand going up really um, up to, the towards the end of the, of the room. So that person who has been waving at me for three minutes now gets the, gets the floor. Yes, to, to the left. Why don't you just stand up and shout? Well, there's a mic uh, on its way, I guess. Well, wait a second, because there's interpretation going on, and they can't interpret you if you shout, unless you shout in a microphone, but you don't need to. No, I, I won't do that. Thank you. Uh, so, my name's Nick Russo. I'm from the Department for Business Innovation and Skills in Britain. I've got an echo here. Um, my question is about the experience of young people starting up in business and the phenomenon of people selling out. I'm really interested to know more about what Michael O'Leary thinks might help to counter that, what support the young people feel they would benefit from that would encourage them to carry on towards growth and to running the kind of thing like uh, Ryanair themselves rather than um, looking for someone else to take it on. Uh, and whether we can do more within Europe um, as against encouraging and, um, American investors to come over. 
I, this is a real challenge. I mean, I think that, that, that every innovator or every new business startup it will face this. It's the biggest challenge these four individuals will face. And I think it'll come quite early in their business lives. When somebody, if you de develop a successful business, you develop a successful product, do you sell out or do you refuse to sell out? I mean, I think one of the, th one of the things we have to make it, uh, the way to encourage people to continue to run their own businesses is, you know, we need to make the tax system that it rewards more that entrepreneurial culture and maybe penalizes more selling out to, you know, the, uh, the Americans or to the big European brands. Um, you know, do you increase the rate, the, the, the profits tax when you sell a business? And on, but on the other hand, do you make it somehow, if you're in, uh, setting up your own company, how do we make it more, ta use the tax system, I think, to encourage people, make it, you know, they have a lower rate of personal tax on the money they draw from the company or something like that. I think we need to make bigger incentives for people, and I think you use the tax system to create bigger incentives for people to stay with their own businesses. And on the other hand, I'd make a slightly bigger penalty on people selling out. But that would be my personal view. I'd be more interested in each of the four, asking each of them, Alex, Maria, Christophe, and Giselle, how do you feel at the moment if somebody came along, you know, the Googles or, I don't know, Nestle comes along to Christophe and says, this is great technology, we want to pay you 100 million. What do, would your disposition be to each of you when you face that challenge? Yes, this... Hello? Yes, this is uh, a question you have to ask yourself all the time. Uh, knowing the projects with the states, uh, we had phone, call, uh, phone calls uh, from the states, from companies. Uh, they called me, Mr. Van Steen, uh, yes, speaking, we want to buy you. Uh, hello? <laughs> this kind of phone calls you get. But then you have to think, what do I want in the future? Do you, need, do you want money? Okay, you think about it. Do you want to develop something, to be proud of your product? Don't do it. Uh, one thing is that if you are a small company and you have to sell to the armed forces or to, to big uh, uh, um, uh, companies, then sometimes it's very difficult. Not because you have a very good product. You have. We, have, we, we are the only one patented uh, product in the world. But you are not strong enough. You need certifications we do not have on this moment. Uh, we need uh, uh, to pay um, advanced payments, we, we, which is difficult if the amount is big. And then maybe selling a part of your shares to a, a, a bigger entity uh, is worthwhile for the company. So it depends on each case, I think. Maria, how do you think you'd feel? Google come along and offer you 100 million. I don't think they will, actually, because... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a good thing, actually. Uh, I don't want to sell anyway. But um, this technology exists already. Um, Autodesk has it as well. Um, so it's not a matter of the technology itself. It's uh, what value you bring to it, how you use it in the market, because the market for, for this is empty. There are infinite possibilities of using it. So there is room for everyone, I believe, in right now. Alex? Well, in our, okay. um, I think in our field, biotech, it's quite hard to stay, as a, stay alive as a small company. Uh, so I guess the, an the answer would be, would be sell. But I don't know. Let's see what well, will happen, hopefully. I think the nature of your business is you sell and start again and yeah, sell yeah, again yeah, yeah. and start again and sell again and start again. Yeah. And Giselle, you'll be selling to me by lunchtime today, you will? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, we all love money, that's, that's a fact, but um, I believe it's more about the individual. Uh, in 50 years, for example, or in 30 years, how would, I, how would I feel about if I thought about I sold my idea? Um, it's more about what you want to achieve as an individual and um, about your personal feeling about it. It's my idea. I don't want to sell it. It's Good. mine. I want to work on it and be proud of it. Good. That's yeah. the way you'll succeed. Very good. Well, um, we're, we're going into the microphone. coffee break, but we will take uh, two more questions. Uh, or how many kind of questions are there? There are three. Let's take three more questions. That's okay with you, Michael, and with the audience. Sure. Um, first question uh, over there. Carlos from uh, an industry association in the high-tech industry. I would like to have your thoughts if there is a gap between the people in Brussels who are making these regulations and, and packages and, uh, and, the, and the real entrepreneurs. 
I think maybe Gerhard and Graf can tell us, you know, the people who work for DG Enterprise and Industry, are, are these people who, who have experience in industry and with business? Those working at DG Research, how many of those are researchers who have experience with that? And how should we do, uh, tackle, if there, is there a gap, how should we tackle the gap? Is it in the, in the personnel selection at that, at that stage? Is it by bringing more industry together with, with the Commission and, and the public authorities in general? So that's my question. Is there a gap? And, and if yes, how could we address it? Yeah, I, sorry, I think there's an enormous gap. And the problem is that entrepreneurs very rarely come to Brussels. The, whereas the vested interests live in Brussels. The unions, the flag carrier airlines have all the representation. They're always meeting people in Brussels. So all that Brussels get is the ideas from, you know, the vested interests of producers, which is why you get all this kind of crappy regulation that increased costs for Europe's consumers. Why don't we have, why is Silicon Valley in the USA? Why haven't we got a Silicon Valley in Europe? With all the great minds we have in Europe, why haven't we created that kind of culture? And I think, you know, I'm a great fan of Europe. I'm a great believer in the European project, but I'm a great believer in the European project as a single market. And how I think what the problem with the people in Brussels is they've lost that focus on how we make a single market, how we remove regulation, how we promote competition between Europe and also make Europe more competitive with the other economic blocks in the world. Because everybody in Brussels, you know, is more worried about how we have political integration and more jobs for the people in Brussels and bigger expenses for the people in Brussels and more meals for the people in Brussels and all that mess, which is what entrepreneurs don't do. I mean, I really, I, go, I have to spend, I'm about twice a year in Brussels, usually promoting my six new routes from Brussels South Charlois Airport in summer 2012. I don't come here because it's a waste of my time talking to the European Commission about how you can actually lower the cost of air travel, because they don't want to lower the cost of air travel. They want to go to Zaventem. They want to take the high fares because they don't pay for them. So I think we need to get much more culturally within the Commission back to a single market, a competitive market, because if we don't learn to compete and if we don't get back to competing in Brussels, Gerard is right. One of the great successes of the European project was airline deregulation. But the problem was the Commission likes to sit in its fat ass talking about a wonderful deal it was. That was 30 years ago. They haven't deregulated the airline industry or the airport industry, which are all national monopolies. They haven't deregulated ATC, which is a shambles. 92% of all flight delays in Europe last year, 92% were due to air traffic control strikes, air traffic control staff shortages, or people not showing up on a Saturday morning. There's something you could be innovative. Why the hell don't you shut down Europe's air traffic control? And what does Brussels say? We'll put the French together with the Spanish. So the, most, the highest paid air traffic controllers who are the Spanish will now work together with the least busy, or the, 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 the air traffic who work least, the French, and what you get is now even higher paid, less productive air traffic controllers. <laughs> Instead of actually the technology exists for the Irish to run the whole, the, for the Irish to run the whole of Europe's air traffic control system. And if the Irish decide to go on strike on Friday, the Spanish can bloody take over. Well, no, sorry, the Spanish will be on strike on a Friday, but we let the Scandinavians do it. So instead of having competition, the monopoly producers and protectors here in the Commission say, we'll just have bigger bloody monopolies. So the next year, I'm afraid it won't be 92% of your flights will be delayed by Europe's air traffic control. It'll be probably 99% of your flights will be delayed by Europe's air traffic control, for which, by the way, you pay about 20% of your ticket price for a service that actually is the worst run service. You don't have air traffic control delays on the same scale in the US. They've only got one system. And when they all went on strike in 1980, Reagan fired the whole bloody lot of them. And no planes fell out of the sky, nothing changed, but they won't go on strike again. Whereas it's a national sport here in Europe between the French, the Germans, the Spanish. Every Friday during this peak summer season, it's our turn to go on strike. We'll go on strike now. So that's where we need innovation. That's where we need less bloody Brussels bureaucracy and more of a focus on single market competition because we're good in Europe. We should compete with the Chinese. We should compete with the Americans. We can beat the bloody pants off them if we just get up off our arses and stop regulating Europe to death. Very good. I mean, see, I, I feel compelled to say that the European Commission is, a, is, is one of the great... Uh, promoters of the single market. There's, of course, a lot of resistance, but it's often from the companies that are going to be suffering more, more competition. I mean, I, I, I know how much uh, Michael likes DG Competition, who's enforcing kind of state aid rules, etc. But 
They know uh, they're just yes, inventing uh, new state aid rules. Well, they, they have been around but for, for a while. Two more questions. Two more questions, and maybe not on this kind of high horse that, that Michael likes to sit on, but on something else. Who are the two uh, questions? There's it's one the question over there, here. and there's one question over there. Maybe the lady first. Uh, hello, this is a question for Michael O'Leary. Um, as, uh, well, I'm Lata Sahanta, I'm from the University of Cambridge. Um, I wanted to know, you said earlier that uh, people at Ryanair don't go on strike. I was wondering how you look after your workforce and also how do you balance um, the interests of your shareholders in comparison to the uh, employees you have? Okay, that was such a good question. I think you get the free flights to Rome for that one. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's well known in Ryanair that I run a Siberian salt mine where on a daily basis we... Uh, whoosh, whip them, you know, into, whip our workers into submission. We employ 8,000 people in Ryanair. We've been doing it for 25 years. We don't have unions, but funnily enough, average pay in Ryanair is the second highest of any of the European airlines. But the productivity is three times higher. So a pilot, by which by European law, another wonderful regulation that they invented in Brussels, a pilot in Europe by law can't fly more than 900 hours a year. Now, lest you think that they're going to die of fatigue, that's about 18 hours a week by law. They won't die from fatigue, they'll die from boredom, uh, because Europe doesn't allow them to fly more than 18 hours a week. But what we do by using efficient rosters, 25-minute turnarounds, and flying to efficient airports like Brussels Charlois, is our pilots on average flew last year about 850 hours. Whereas pilots in Air France and Lufthansa on their short-haul fleet last year, wait for it, flew about 300 hours, about 10 hours a week. And the difference, again, and I think it's what the entrepreneurs will always find in the private sector, the difference between the private sector and the public sector is not usually pay, because the public sector finds some way of benchmarking themselves against the private sector. It's always productivity. We work harder in the private sector. We don't waste money in the private sector. We fly to Brussels, Charleroi. We use low fares airlines in the private sector. And how we motivate people in the private sector is I pay you more in Ryanair, but you in return will work harder than your equivalent office at numbers in the cosseted, protected flag carrier airline community in Europe. Very that good. Last question, short question, short answer, please, and then we can I have flights to Madrid or a pair of flights to Dublin for whoever asks the next question. Or you can have my last calendar. Good morning. My name is... Uh, yeah. Good morning. My name is Gregor Novak. I'm working for a business and cultural development center from Greece. Um, you need a flight. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I think because he's from Greece, we'll give him the charity calendar and the flights to Madrid. Cheers, Michael. Uh, thank you. Thank, thanks to everybody for wonderful presentations. And um, I would like to go back to technology and innovation because I've seen that um, Ryanair was quite innovative with PR. And I, it will never, I'll never understand how you managed to rename Charleroi South Brussels because basically it's Charleroi, it's one hour away from Brussels. Um, I would like to ask you what Ryanair is thinking about uh, technology innovation in the uh, air industry, because we're still flying with engines that were developed 50 years ago, and the system hasn't changed in the last years. I think that's true, but the difference is what's changed in the last 50 years is you're flying with engine technology, jet engine technology, that hasn't changed, but the cost of flying has reduced by about 90%. To be fair to the Commission, uh, that's because of the deregulation decision, which, by the way, was led by an Irishman called Peter Sutherland almost 30 years ago. Um, so, and I think what's different for consumers is that the cost has come crashing down, or at least in those places where Ryanair operates. Um, your question on uh, Brussels South Charleroi, it, it actually, uh, what happens in most cities in Europe, there's this myth that actually the, the main airport is in the centre of the, 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 the square, the centre of town. Zaventem isn't in the centre of Brussels either. Most European cities, or at least cities with a successful tourism policy, have a multiplicity of airports. Some will be closer to the centre of the city, some will be further out. Charleroi is further out than Zaventem. The key thing you miss in Brussels is it's not whether you think Charleroi is an acceptable airport for Brussels or not, although the parking is cheaper and it's easier to get through. 
The difference is that many visitors coming to Brussels see Charleroi as a perfectly acceptable alternative, alternative as a gateway to Brussels, to Zaventem Airport. And it's the visitors that you're trying to bring into the country. It's the visitors you're trying to bring to, uh, to, to, to Belgium and to Brussels that now have at least a choice for the first time. Because 20 years ago, before Reiner started flying to Charleroi, it was just 600 quid with Sabina to Zaventem. And it was fine. The bureaucrats, the politicians and the people on business expense could afford to fly to Zaventem, but nobody else could. Now, thanks to Ryanair and Brussels South Charleroi Airport, you have a choice. You can pay the very high fares and fly to Zaventem and be collected by the European Commission in their limousines, or you can arrive for nine quid at Brussels Charleroi. There's a bus that'll take you into the centre of Brussels. But all of a sudden, visitor numbers to Belgium and to Brussels have mushroomed as a result of the success of Charleroi. So it's not that one necessarily replaces the other. It's that you now provide consumers and visitors here with choice. If you take your home country in Greece, Athens, there's no choice. Athens is a mess. The airport is a mess. Olympic is a mess. It's a producer-run monopoly. So it's all, I mean, the purpose of Olympic is to keep people, pilots and the people who don't work very hard at Olympic Airways, in the very fat salaries and the early retirement schemes that they've become accustomed to over many years, which is a tragedy because 30 years ago, Olympic was one of the most successful and most productive airlines in Europe but it was largely run by the private sector in those days. We need more airports in and around Athens so that competition can bring down the cost of travel to and from Greece, can encourage more people to visit Greece, encourage more Greeks to get the hell out of the country or move their euros offshore out of Greece before it devalues, and encourage more two-way travel, both in ideas and the free movement of goods and labour. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very, you very much. much. Ladies and gentlemen, um, just to, to me, we're conclu concluding this, uh, this master class now. I think it was a lot of fun. I mean, Michael promised a lot of fun, and I think we got it. Uh, I think he earned himself also a place at, at next year's Innovation Convention. So, so uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, he will be here again uh, soon. I'd like to, uh, to thank Michael, of course. The Commission's limousine is waiting outside for you to take <laughs> you to, 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 with to a bomb, Brussels. With to, a bomb in the boot. <laughs> <laughs> to Brussels uh, South Airport. I'd like to thank our, our, our protagonists, I mean, uh, Alexander, here, Maria, here. Uh, Christophe and Gisela for their excellent presentation. Um, uh, wish them a lot of success as they uh, grow their business and, and we will hear from them uh, certainly uh, in the near future. So thank you, thanks to the interpreters and I wish you a very good uh, continuation of the day. Well done. Well done. Well done. Really fun. <laughs>